welcome to our podcast on political socialization. Basically, what influences people to think the way they do when they think about politics? It's a pretty big word for a relatively simple concept, but we wanted to give you guys some details on this. So here we go. So like we mentioned, political socialization is a pretty fancy word for a pretty simple concept. Think about this. Why do we think about politics the way that we do? What has influenced us to think this way? That is political socialization. So as we dive into political socialization a little bit more, please consider stereotypes. We will talk about trends in this presentation, but there are always exceptions. So while we may say that people from the South tend to vote a certain way, and you're hearing that go, wait a second, but I tend to think this way about politics, that's okay. Just because there is a stereotype doesn't mean that there aren't exceptions as well. You can certainly be influenced in many directions from many of these factors. Ultimately, you are who you are, and you vote the way you vote, and you think about politics the way you think about politics. You're probably not consciously thinking, oh, I think this way because of that Thanksgiving dinner we had back in 1982 when Grandpa told that funny joke. You're probably not able to narrow it down that specifically to why you think what you think. But political scientists have often looked back on many of these large factors as trend setters for how people tend to think about politics and then tend to vote based on that. And then ultimately, you may see benefits to voting for either the Republicans or for the Democrats. Perhaps either party has some good ideas that you like. Perhaps you value one party's stance on social issues but you value another party's stance on financial issues. That's totally fine. You are who you are. We're not saying that every single person who votes Republican is a certain way, or that every person who votes Democrat is another certain way. There are exceptions to every trend. We are all unique people in how we think, but it comes down to this. We only have one vote we can cast. We can't vote for this guy because of his social stance and this girl because of her financial stance. We only have one vote. We kind of have to balance that reality with the theory of all the things we're thinking and all the different ways the world has influenced us. So let's go ahead and see what we're talking about here. So one of the big factors that influence us in all facets of our life is the idea of our family. Who did we grow up with? What did the family look like to us? Was it the very traditional one man, one woman household? Was it mom, dad, extended family living with us? That might shape how we think about things. How many siblings did we have? Were we the oldest and we saw the world differently from our middle or from our youngest sibling? Did we have foster kids in the home? Did we have adoptive kids in the home? Did we have stepchildren in the home? Did we have a very small family where we just might have had one cousin? Or were we from some humongous family that had 21 first cousins or who knows what? Since we spent a lot of our growing up time with family, we have to look at that as a pretty significant factor in terms of how we may or may not vote. Because perhaps our family has voted a certain way for years and years, and that is very appealing to us. Or perhaps our family has voted a certain way for years and years, and we've kind of grown away from that for certain reasons. But one thing we need to look at when thinking about why do we think what we think in terms of politics, we need to look at our family. Another issue we need to look at in terms of how we vote and why we think politically is where we get our information from in terms of media. How much of our life is bombarded by media these days? Social media, the news media, it's all out there. And every time we hop on Facebook and we respond to a certain story, some algorithm is created that says, hey, you might also like this story. Which news media outlets do we tend to watch? Do we watch NBC, CBS? Do we watch CNBC or Fox? While news outlets try to be as unbiased as possible, if they're just delivering the news and not opinion, certain bias is still revealed. I mean, people are people and their biases get in their way. And so depending on which media outlets you may be watching or listening to, that could sway you in terms of how you vote. If you listen to certain news outlets, you may say, huh, That guy really is doing a horrible job as president. I guess I should vote the other way next time. Or, on the same issue, another news outlet may say, that guy did make the right choice. And you may respond, huh, I guess I should keep voting for that party. They seem to be doing a good job. So even though news tries to be as unbiased as possible, there are media outlets out there that have some bias, and that can certainly shape how we vote. 
A third thing to look at in terms of how we think politically is how do our friends vote? What do our friends think? What do our peers believe? Sometimes we succumb to peer pressure and say, well, hey, my best friend says that this candidate is really awesome. I don't know too much about him or her, so I guess I'll vote the same way. Or you could be looking at some of your peers saying, yeah, this guy's a complete idiot. He wants to vote for this person. I'm totally voting for the opposite candidate because my friend doesn't know what they're talking about. So who you hang around with and who you consider your peers can certainly have an influence on how you potentially vote in the next elections. The trend tends to be that kids in high school tend to be a little bit more conservative than the overall norm in America. And then as students move into the college levels, college students overall tend to be a little bit more liberal than the national norm. And again, when we're speaking in generalizations, you could be that exception. You could be the exceptionally liberal high schooler or the very exceptionally conservative college student. That's totally okay. You are who you are. But the next time you're thinking about why do I want to vote for this person at the next election, think about who your friends are. Who have they voted for? What are they saying? that might be shaping your own thoughts. Level of education can shape political socialization. So think about what level of education you hope to attain, or maybe that you have obtained, or perhaps that your family members have obtained. Are they high school dropouts? Have they earned a high school diploma? Maybe a four-year bachelor's degree? Maybe a couple year program for a master's degree, perhaps an even longer time in terms of a PhD program or a doctorate degree. Studies show that certain levels of education tend to vote in certain patterns, where sometimes people who drop out of high school see the world in a certain way and they tend to vote for certain parties, whereas people who have more education tend to see the world differently and they tend to vote a certain way as well. We also have to think about from where you did receive that education. While universities seek to teach the subject matter that their students want, as we mentioned before, sometimes students that reach that college level tend to see the world differently, tend to become a little bit more liberal in their worldview, and then potentially tend to vote a certain way in the next elections. But think about the university itself. Think about where that university is located. Is it located in a large city? Large cities or urban areas tend to be a little bit more liberal overall. Is that university or college set in a more rural setting? Well, small town America tends to vote a certain way. So if you're going to Bryant College, founded by Williams Jenning Bryant, a pretty conservative political figure, I'm going to guess that that university may espouse a certain conservative viewpoint on the world. So it's not only the level of education that may help someone see the world in a certain way, but also from where that education came could also shape how somebody views the world and potentially how they vote. We should also consider what religion or faith we ascribe to. Overall, religions tend to be kind of traditional and therefore politically tend to be more conservative, so they may perhaps vote a certain way in upcoming elections. Certain religions do or don't allow certain things to happen, and if we are going to a certain church and hearing people say certain things on Sunday morning, that may be shaping how we think. If we're hearing our pastor say this and that about certain groups of people, certain races, certain ethnicities, sexual orientations, that may be shaping us in terms of who we are and what we think. At the same time, people in church could be hearing these words and saying, you know what, I hear what my pastor is saying, but I personally don't really agree with that. And so they could be challenging that influence from their church and choosing to vote a certain way or perhaps a different way in the upcoming election. Additionally, within religions, some are more conservative than others. In Lutheranism, for example, there are kind of two branches. One is a little bit more conservative. One is a little bit more liberal. Certain conservative Missouri Synod church may be very conservative and encourage people to live a very traditional life and see certain elements of society in a certain way. And if you're hearing sermons from that church, you may vote a certain way. If you come from the more evangelical branch, if a voter is attending the evangelical Lutheran branch of the Lutheran church, a more liberal thinking church, then perhaps they're hearing a different worldview from the sermons and may or may not be influenced when they walk into the voting booth. Another element of political socialization is the voter's race. Is the voter Caucasian, Latino, Asian, African-American, 
Again, political trends tend to say that certain races tend to vote a certain way at various elections. So perhaps somebody coming from an African-American community may choose to vote this way on certain issues, whereas somebody from the Hispanic community may choose to vote a different way or a similar way based on their race and how they were raised. And again, these are large trends and stereotypes because not every black person votes the same way. Not every white person votes the same way as everybody in their neighborhood. But when trying to predict and think about how might people vote, what influences have shaped them, we do need to look at the voters' race as a potential impact on how they vote. We also need to consider the voters' gender. Males and females tend to vote differently on certain issues. We also need to consider, in the current day, sexual orientation. What is the orientation of the voter? Someone who is a heterosexual voter may vote in a similar fashion or in a different fashion from a homosexual voter. So we need to think about the gender of the voter because sometimes those large trends of this is what women are thinking on an issue or here's how men are thinking on an issue certainly shape members within that group. We also need to consider the age of the voter in terms of how somebody may vote. Younger people tend to vote certain ways, middle-aged people vote differently, and then senior citizens tend to vote in certain ways also. Now, we mentioned that high schoolers tend to be a little bit more conservative than the norm. College kids tend to be a little bit more liberal than the norm. Well, what happens when people come out of college and enter into the real world, regardless of what age that is? Perhaps they continue to think in a like-minded way to their college peers or to their young adult peers or to their married peers. But as they age, might they see the world differently? And then might they choose to have that influence change how they vote on certain things? One of the most powerful lobbying groups in the United States is the AARP, the American Association of Retired Persons, basically older people. A lot of these older people have a lot of time on their hand. They're very savvy politically. They do a lot of thinking about their world, and they are oftentimes the one who casts the most votes as an age voting block. So how does this nation get shaped by the fact that senior citizens turn out in droves to the polls and many senior citizens tend to vote a certain way at the national election level? So think about ourselves. As we age, do we see the world differently? And perhaps would we choose to vote in similar or different fashions based on what our age and our experience in the world is shaping us toward? And then the last idea that we'd look at is the idea of geography. Where do we live? And how does where we live potentially influence how we vote? If you grow up in the South, what kind of ideas are you going to be surrounded with? You have your family, you have your peers at your high school, your peers in your college, you have the people that you interact with at the community level. What does the South value? Therefore, how might they vote on certain issues? And if you're growing up in the South and all you're hearing is one way or the other about an issue, seems kind of likely that you'd vote in that fashion. At the same time, you could also have been growing up with all of those values and all those things that you're hearing and you're saying to yourself, you know what, I think individually I really just don't like that value. I'm going to choose to vote the other way, which is totally that idea of stereotypes and trends that we've talked about and how we're still individuals at heart. But geography does matter. If you're growing up in small town America, might you vote differently than a large urban area like Chicago or Los Angeles? If you're growing up in the Northeast, might you vote differently than if you grew up in Texas? If you're growing up in Minnesota, might you vote differently than if you grew up in Alabama? Again, there are always exceptions, but something we need to consider when we're looking at all the different factors that shape us as political thinkers and eventually political voters is, where have we grown up? How has our childhood and young adult life shaped us as potential thinkers and potential voters? So that's it in terms of political socialization. Again, a pretty fancy term for basically thinking about all the different things that influence our thinking and influence how we may or may not vote in the next election. Our family, our friends, our religion, our levels of education, our race, our gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, all of those things and all of the peer groups that are associated with those may have an influence on us as voters. And so as we are examining trends and patterns in American government, one thing we often go back to is political socialization. So I think that's it for now. As always, if you have any questions, please bring those in the class. Otherwise, thanks so much, and we will see you soon.